Let's continue to talk about how we perceive people. This time, let's focus on some biases that we have, specifically confirmation biases. After we've made up our minds about people, we often tend to seek out information, interpret information, and sometimes even create new information that verifies or confirms our existing beliefs. Let me give you a real quick example. We recently voted in a new president. So, of course, our country is about divided between Trump supporters and people who oppose Trump. Think about the information that they're likely to seek out over the next several years. People who support Trump are likely to seek out information that shows that Trump has been successful and that he's doing well. People who oppose Trump are likely to seek out evidence that he's not doing so well and that in some areas he's failing. That's just a, a quick example of what I mean, that we often seek out information that verifies or confirms our existing beliefs. Sometimes even ambiguous or, or mixed information can be used to confirm our existing beliefs, and that's, that's problematic because if the information that we're acquiring is ambiguous or mixed, it doesn't seem like it should necessarily fully confirm our existing beliefs. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In this particular research study, um, people were asked to evaluate a student named Hannah. And at first they were given differing expectations. So half of the research subjects were told that Hannah comes from a relatively affluent neighborhood and that her parents are well-educated. The other half of the people were told that she comes from a relatively poor inner city neighborhood and that her parents are not very well educated. So some of them had relatively high expectations for her. Some of them had relatively low expectations for her. And the people who had relatively high expectations for her, sorry about that, they put her in a reading level that was somewhat higher than the people who had lower expectations of her. Same thing for mathematics. People who had higher expectations for her put her in a somewhat higher uh, grade level for mathematics compared to the people who had a lower expectation of her. Let's talk about the people in this group. These people actually viewed her performing, and these are the people that got the mixed evidence about her. And this is because when she was taking this test, there were some difficult items, and she did well on them. And there were some easy items, and she missed them. In other words, she did about average. So... This did not necessarily confirm the beliefs of the people who had high expectations, and her performance did not necessarily confirm the beliefs of people who had low expectations. However, their existing beliefs were really fueled by that mixed evidence. So the people who viewed her taking the test, and they saw that she did about average, when they had high expectations for her, they placed her in a higher reading level compared to the people who had low expectations. Same thing with mathematics. So you can see this is a bias, such that our initial beliefs about people influence the way we interpret the information that we receive. And furthermore, we often cling to our initial beliefs even after they've been discredited, and that's really a problem. If, if I've made up my mind about someone, and then I get information about them that's completely contrary, I need to be flexible in my thought so that I can be fair to that person and so I can be accurate when I'm forming an impression about this person. But people often cling to those initial beliefs that they've had. Let me give you an example. This is just an example of the general thought process. Um, a lot of people obviously are concerned about autism and there's been a lot of research done on, done on it over the past several decades. And um, much of the fear that parents have about autism comes from some research that was done years ago uh, that was based on just a few kids, about eight kids. And the parents said that after their kids received immunizations, they showed symptoms of autism shortly thereafter. And this research was published in The Lancet, which is a journal that has a pretty good reputation. And the author of that study proposed that the vaccine might trigger some previously unknown form of regressive autism. So it was a, you know, an interesting theory, and it scared a lot of people. Well, since then, there have been many, many studies with literally millions of children comparing children who have been vaccinated with children who have not been vaccinated, and there have been no significant differences in autism between the kids who have been vaccinated and the kids who have not been vaccinated. So in general, it's very unlikely that the vaccinations are causing the autism. And in fact, that original study was retracted. 
And people were looking at it, of course, a little bit more closely over the years, and they realized it was horribly flawed. Um, it seemed like these researchers didn't even really understand how to do the basic analyses that were necessary. Uh, I often wonder how it, how it really ever got published in the first place. Yet people still really cling to that belief that vaccines might cause autism. And this is even based, um, you know, on, in the face of information to the contrary, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, the World Health Organization, the Institute of Medicine, they all agree that there's probably no relationship between autism uh, and vaccines. Well, this is pretty much fueled by something that we call uh, belief perseverance or belief perseverance, depending on how you like to pronounce that word. It's essentially the tendency to maintain our beliefs even after they've been discredited. It's one of these confirmation biases that I'm telling you about. Now, it's possible to chip away at that bias by asking people to consider some alternative explanations for um, why this evidence might be true. So, for example, when you start to talk to people about children and when they start to develop autistic symptoms, you start to realize that there's uh, probably a coincidence going on because symptoms of autism start to develop right around when kids are scheduled to get their vaccines. So that's an alternative explanation uh, that's probably much more credible, at least based on the data that we have. But you can understand why parents are sometimes hesitant to give up that fear. And that's because when children are, are hurt or children have some type of uh, disease, some type of disorder, they demand to know why. And it's not very fulfilling to hear that, well, there's a coincidence. You know, your, your child was just vaccinated, but, you know, this, this disorder comes on around this time. So, again, this just shows a, a bias in the way that people think. Let's talk a little bit more about some uh, biases in the way that we think. We were just discussing how um, people are biased in the way that they interpret information. Well, people are also somewhat biased in the way that they seek out information. And by default, we are we're not necessarily great social scientists. Um, we often do seek out social evidence that confirms our initial beliefs and hypotheses. And let me give you a, another example here of, of this new situation, which we're really seeking out information to confirm our beliefs. Imagine a research study. This was done in the 70s. It was a really interesting study where pairs of strangers were brought into the lab and they were told this was a study trying to understand how people get to know each other. And they were told that they were going to be interviewing each other. Now, some of the people were led to believe that the person who they were going to be interviewing was an introvert. And the other people, the other half of the research subjects, were led to believe that the person that they would be interviewing would be an extrovert. And then they were told to pick from a whole list of questions that they could ask this person. And when the person was told that they were going to interview an introvert, they were much more likely to pick these types of questions. Uh, have you ever been left out of a social group? felt like you've been left out of a social group? Do you sometimes prefer to avoid crowds and people? And you can tell by the types of questions that they picked, they were trying to seek out evidence to confirm that this person was an introvert. Now, good scientists usually try to find some evidence to disconfirm their beliefs because you know, they want to they wanna be able to prove themselves wrong, essentially, because if they can prove themselves wrong, they kind of learn more information about what's really going on. If after trying really hard, you're unable to prove yourself wrong, then you're probably on the right track. The bottom line is these people weren't testing the hypothesis very well. If this person's an introvert, then yes, they might respond positively to these questions. But if the person's an extrovert, they're not necessarily tapping into that. And, and that's because social information is very complex. I mean, let's say I'm an extrovert and I'm asked the question, have you ever felt like you've been left out of a social group? Of course I've felt that way. We all feel that way. So do you see my point? If you want to try to figure out if I'm an extrovert and you ask me these questions, you're not going to figure out if I'm an extrovert. Do I sometimes prefer to avoid crowds and people? Of course I do. Even as an extrovert, of course, sometimes I want to be in that situation where I'm alone and avoiding a crowd because social information is very complex. It's quite varied. But if you're seeking out simply to confirm I'm an introvert, you're likely to think that I am an introvert. You're likely to find information that confirms that. So that's my point here. Any search for validating information 
is likely to succeed, and that's not necessarily a good thing. You need to also seek out some information that wouldn't validate your existing beliefs. That's how we really learn at a more complete level what's really going on with people. And that's what we're talking about in this chapter. How do we make sense of other people? Well, in general, people tend to seek out information that confirms their initial hypotheses. That's my point right here. Well, biased information seeking can really leave us with a, a skewed or inaccurate impression of the people that we're seeking to understand. So if I'm asking this person all these questions about being an introvert, I'm likely to find information that confirms that, and I'll be left thinking that this person's an introvert, when in reality the person's not an introvert at all, potentially. I hope that makes sense. Let's talk a little bit also about self-fulfilling prophecies. This is, again, related to confirmation biases. Remember, we've been talking about these confirmation biases that talk about how we tend to seek out, interpret, and sometimes even create information that confirms our beliefs. Well, self-fulfilling prophecies are, are really very interesting because sometimes our expectations about people can lead people to act in ways that confirm those expectations. It's, it's almost this magical thing. Let's talk about it. Um, Oftentimes, self-fulfilling prophecies are used unknowingly. I mean, we're engaging or, or helping to um, create a situation where self-fulfilling prophecies will occur without even knowing it. And sometimes there are amazingly positive results. Let me, let me give you an example of a couple studies that have been done to, to look into this. Some people were told uh, that in their classrooms, there are some late bloomers. So they were told that, you know, like they were given some type of test and they can tell that these kids are on the cusp of some type of intellectual growth spurt, essentially. Now, it's likely that in those situations, the teachers are going to look at the kids a little bit differently and have some different expectations about those kids. And it's possible if they look at them differently and have these different expectations, they might actually treat them differently. And then the kids might pick up on that. And if the kids are picking up on the fact that my teacher really has these high hopes for me, they might then really prosper. And research has shown in this type of situation uh, that later on, like about eight months later or so when they were tested for IQ, they actually showed more increases in their IQ compared to control subjects uh, where teachers were not given any information about those kids going through some type of intellectual growth spurt. Same type of situation was studied with um, military recruits. Uh, there were platoon leaders who were told that these military recruits had great potential, you know, based on some testing. And then, um, of course, these platoon leaders started working with these um, military recruits. And after like 10 weeks of training, it was found that the military recruits who were deemed to have high potential later on scored higher on some written tests and even physical tests where they were using their weapons compared to control people. So it's, it's sometimes amazing that just our expectations about people, particularly when they're positive, can lead those people to perform more positively, more successfully. Now, unfortunately, the flip side of this can also be true. And people might put themselves in a situation or create a situation where their expectations uh, lead people, knowingly or unknowingly, uh, to confirm their negative beliefs. Let me give you a couple examples. So some people are you know, relatively insecure about social situations. They're relatively socially awkward. They expect that when they get into some type of social interaction with someone else, that they're gonna be rejected, that things aren't gonna go well. So think about how that's going to influence their behavior. If they're already fearing rejection, they're going to probably act in a relatively off-putting way. If they act in an off-putting way, the people who they interact with are probably not going to react positively. In fact, they'll probably react somewhat negatively. And then once they react somewhat negatively, you know, the person is going to sense that and they're going to realize, I was right. You know, these social interactions just don't work out for me. So that would be an example there of a self-fulfilling prophecy leading to a negative result. Same thing can happen, unfortunately, in our educational system. Oftentimes, minority students um, are seen by their teachers as kids who don't hold great promise. And of course, if um, a teacher has a relatively low expectation about a student, um, it's likely that the students can pick up on that. They won't necessarily be really motivated about school. Uh, and then their behaviors will confirm the teacher's existing belief. Uh, so that, again, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, think about who knew we had so much power that just the way we think about people uh, can really influence the way that those people behave. 
if you think about it, you can really help make and break other people just based on what you think about those people and your expectations. That's really a lot of social influence and we really need to use it very wisely because we can use it for good. And if we're not careful, the way we think and expect things of other people can lead to real, really negative results. Let's talk about self-fulfilling prophecies in just a little bit more detail so you can see how these three steps emerge in the process. I was just recently reading an article in the uh, Monitor magazine, which is a publication of the American Psychological Association. And it showed a picture of this young man right here, and it says this boy would be three times more likely to be placed in a gifted education program if he had a black rather than a white teacher. And that's an unfortunate statistic, and to some extent that is fueled by self-fulfilling prophecy. Let's walk through it, and I'll help you understand. So let's keep that, that young man in mind. Well, let's first assume here that the teacher involved has some racial biases, and those biases toward that young man lead the teacher to have relatively low expectations for his academic performance. Well, if the teacher has relatively low expectations, it's likely that that's going to influence his behavior toward that student. He's the target, the student right there. So maybe he want, might not call on him as much when there are difficult questions. Maybe just in general, he might not encourage him, you know, to think about college or to think about some gifted program, whatever it might be. Now, of course, that young man is going to pick up on that. So the target's behavior, his behavior, is going to change. And he's going to realize, you know, my teacher doesn't really like me. Um, my teacher doesn't feel I can handle this type of material. It's likely to leave him somewhat unmotivated. He might not like school. He might not like the teacher. Now, of course, the teacher's going to pick up on that. You see how it's a loop. So the teacher's going to pick up on the fact that he seems somewhat unmotivated, that he seems like he doesn't like school, that he might not like him or her or the teacher. And of course, that's going to continue to fuel that teacher's expectations, and in this case, relatively low expectations about his performance. So this reminds me of a, of a relatively famous phrase, the soft bigotry of low expectations. And um, that young man needs to operate successfully in school under that cloud of um, bigotry, which is fueled primarily based on low expectations. And we've learned that your expectations can have a huge influence on people. And what we're talking about in this chapter is how we make sense of people, how we put together information to have an impression about people. And of course, that's going to be influenced quite a bit based on what we expect. All right, well, that's about it for this section, but stay tuned because more social psychology is coming up soon.